Shalom. So I am here with uh, some, well, I, I call Gavin kind of like my soul brother because when we got to know each other, um, we seem to be motivated, I think, by a lot of very similar thinking. And um, so we, we really hit it off. Uh, we've, we've kind of tried to start this project, um, which I call Securing Cognitive uh, Distributed Cognition. And um, I, I wanna talk about that. Uh, and we, we've start and we've gotten to the point where um, Gavin has started something because Gavin has um, skills I, I do not at all at, with computers. And uh, we got to a point where I was able to show Paul Vanderclay what uh, what had started, and um, he he thought it was a very interesting project. It was something he wanted to give support to and voice support for. Um, so, I guess I'll start by just explaining what secure what I mean by securing co uh, distributed cognition, and so. I'm not sure I, I've shared this story with uh, many people. I don't think I've, to, I, I've told Gavin. Uh, so this will come as a little surprise to you. But when I was, um, I was in university, I was doing a joint uh, law degree with a master's of public administration. And uh, without getting too much into the details of it, I saw a problem that uh, was very obviously a problem and everybody knew it was a problem. Um, and it's, it's a very expensive problem that causes a lot of harm in general. And I saw what I thought could be a solution to it. And I decided to write a, a master's thesis on it. Very excited at the idea that you know, if um, I was going to University of Southern California, that if I print this this master's thesis and it goes through the process of being approved as a master's thesis, then it would kind of enter the human thought stream and without necessarily being in any way attributed to me, um, that it would end up actually causing what I thought was a lot of good. And what became very clear to me during that process was um, that the powers that be, I would call them, um, were not interested in solving this problem. <laughs> there were too many people who were uh, making lots and lots of money from this problem and too few people who realized the amount of damage that it did. And um, so just, just not only wasn't anybody interested in my solution, but nobody was really interested in the problem. And uh, this, this caused me to go this was one of the things that caused me to get very depressed because I, I really felt like, okay, I, I, could, I could do as much good as I wanted to in my life. It would never, it would never come out to be, you know, um, as good as this simple solution, which, um, and now there are even much better solutions to this problem. And there is a book that was, written by uh, two academics and it got printed. Um, it, 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 and the Amazon reviews are just all, you know, people from the industry saying that uh, this person doesn't know what they're talking about. And, and so the book has gone nowhere. And it's solely a book about the problem, which did a much better job than I think I ever would have. And uh, it, it's gone nowhere, right? So for me, so the, this idea of distributed cognition I got from John Verveke, 
And John Verveke, you know, he talks about how we as human beings, you know, um, share cognition with other people, right? And um, what it seems to me is that there's that our our collective cognition is being manipulated in ways that uh, are really harmful. Um, yeah, so I, I just spoke a, a really long time. Uh, so Gavin, if, if, if we can, well, what, do you, what would you like to share about your motivations about securing cognition? I think, uh, I guess I just go from personal experience of trying to naively reach out to people who um, don't have the time uh, or the energy or the technology um, to um, search out for what I thought would be a valuable uh, response. Um, so there's a problem of scale, which is what I'm like, that's what I'm really interested in. Um, I've noticed early on uh, when I got out of college that there's a lot of problems that information technology can solve um, and they can help humans solve um, that a human cannot solve on their own. So in general, I'm, I'm interested in using information technology to, um, to deal with uh, massive amounts of information uh, within, a, within small amounts of time. Um, and, and I see where that general um, approach of using information technology, um, I have the hope that it would uh, uh, allow us to solve important problems. So um, I also, <laughs> there's something I've called a, um, a human resource problem. Um, it's closely connected in the, and it's, it's based on a kind of faith that there are um, humans that have tried to um, develop their skills, their knowledge, um, their morality, everything about themselves. Um, and basically um, are being ignored. So people who understand important problems and have ideas about um, answers to those problems, they get ignored. And, um, and I know that part of that is that it just happens by accident. Um, so that's, that's my, my general interest. Um, and I do think that, um, I think that, that there's, there's a lot of reasons why this happens, but um, I'm interested in connecting with people who um, are serious about um, attempting to use information technology to solve an important problem. And so, um, yeah, this, this, this distributed cognition is about connecting humans um, in order to identify important problems and identify uh, solutions for those important problems. Um, that's, that's the general, that's my general thinking um, about this. Yeah, so um, one thing that uh, you were able to do, which I would have never known how to do, was um, you, you, on your Discord server, you have a channel that actually, um, that actually mimics with my Discord channel. There's a bot that, that uh, moves, I guess, or duplicates uh, the messages over. Um, so if anybody is interested in this, uh, and we'll get into the actual email project, but um, they, can, they can join my Discord server or your Discord server. Um, one thing about the two of us being soul brothers, I've noticed uh, we both don't work so well with others. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, but we also both don't want our, our egos to stop what could be something good happening for uh, lots of people. And so, um, honestly, if, if, if this is something that, that somebody finds interesting and um, I'm not their favorite person, which is very understandable. I'm not a lot of people's <laughs> favorite person. And 
Same or for me. You, or <laughs> yeah. you're not their favorite person. Um, it's I, I I think I think there's still hopefully some way that we can allow uh, allow people who aren't uh, allow people to work together, even though uh, that doesn't necessarily mean we agree on everything or we even like each other, but um, just purely from a matter of you know, we we all see that there is a problem here, uh, and um, that that we would be able to contribute to a solution. Um, I I think I I have a much bigger emphasis on what I believe is uh, people who are deliberately acting out of bad faith. Than you do, I think. You know, you 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 see, um, there's there's a lot that could be done without dealing with necessarily bad faith because it looks like things are very broken. But I think the brokenness is very deliberate, and I think there's so much people. There's so many people who are. Uh, bad actors hiding behind incompetence that um, at this point we we can't give people the benefit of the doubt so um, that that causes me to some extent to be a little bit defensive and a little bit offensive but really I mean at, at this point I, I don't think at this point, I, I just would like anybody who is interested to um, to start contributing to the email project. Um, and I guess we can we can get started talking about the email project. So the idea was that we um, we know many people. Um, I, I I like to consider Eric Weinstein a friend of mine. Uh, I, I know several other people who I would say are prominent enough that lots of people would like to get their uh, attention. Uh, I was very involved and still to some extent am involved in the Jordan Peterson community. And I think a lot of us would like to be able to, um, if nothing else, just be able to like uh, send a link somewhere where we know that it would actually get processed, right? If if there's an important idea that it it would get processed and bubble up to people like um, many celebrities like Paul Vanderclay, and then larger celebrities like Jordan Peterson, and even you know, people ultimately like Joe Rogan, right, who um, have a huge platform. But part of that problem is getting lost in um, everything that exists, right? It, it, it's millions of us trying to get information in front of Jordan Peterson. And some of that is spam. One thing that I've noticed with Eric Weinstein is it's not just spam. There are actually people, real human beings who um, whose sole goal was to sabotage what was going on in, in Eric's community. And uh, they did it successfully. They destroyed his Discord server and he doesn't come on Discord anymore because of the types of behaviors. One of this one guy, he actually contacted Eric's wife's coworkers. Not just you know, it's it's like, but anyway. <laughs> so um, going back to the email project. So the idea was that we would have something like an email, 
and this is how it works right now is uh, we've set up a dummy um, email for Paul Vanderclay. Um, and you've created this system where the um, there's a website that pulls the email into um, into the website so that hopefully what would happen is crowds of people, right? My, my idea was that we could use the very, the energy of the very thing which was causing the problem, which is so many people were interested, right? So that um, this website would allow us to, uh, to help weed out anything that's, that's spam weed out anything that's that's harmful or you know not um and one of the things for me is is actually securing this process away from bad actors but that's that's something that can come later on and to help important if nothing else for paul to have a an email address that anybody can send for example a link to an article or a video to. And if enough people think that's a great video, it would bubble up to the top, kind of like Reddit was supposed to be. But unfortunately, um, my experience, I just remember going on the insurance Reddit, uh, Reddit subreddit and giving somebody an answer that everybody who works in insurance knows is true, but doesn't want to talk about, like not everybody should buy life insurance. And um, I was pretty new to that forum. And my, my response to this person's question about life insurance got voted down so much that my account got disabled. <laughs> That's funny. It, I wonder... And you, uh, and you're an expert on insurance. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and all I said was, um, not everybody should be buying life insurance. And I explained what life insurance is for, and you know that people should only buy life insurance if, for example, like you, they have little kids, right? That older people shouldn't be buying life insurance to cover their funeral costs. They should just go and pay for their funeral costs, right? Because right. they know that's something that's going to happen. And yeah, it, and obviously the insurance, you know, the, most of the people who are on the insurance subreddit are people who sell insurance. And they thought that a lot of them go around saying everybody should buy life insurance, which is ridiculous. And they know it, but they they say it because that's where their financial interest is, right? Right. So, if you if you want to describe from from um, your uh, your view the the project and where it stands and um, what what your thinking is. Okay. Yeah. It's um, so it started. It starts off as a uh, proof of concept. And it's a, um, so it can't, all of the different um, features can be enhanced, but the, basically the, the interface is email um, and uh, you could have more than one interface at some point, but that's what we started with. And um, the, the way we've built it right now is that um, you can, um, you can enter in your email address um, as part of the crowd um, if you want to, right? Actually, you, in order for you to participate, you have to enter in your email address is the way it works right now. Um, and the, the reason for that is we are trying to prevent basically bad actors from being able to, um, you know, cast a lot of votes, right? For, for certain um, signals. Um, 
so you enter an email address, you receive a, um, a link to be able to log in. And then you can do things like um, uh, basically assign different fil uh, labels to incoming email messages. And um, so like uh, Jacob was saying, you could identify spam, for example, um, or if it, you know, for someone, um, you know, for someone like Paul, he, it, there may be a prayer request or something like that. So each, each person who has, you know, this incoming mailbox um, may have different goals and the community around this person by knowing their goals can attempt to, you know, uh, decide what messages are considered noise and are filtered and which messages are signals. Um, and this is all through this interaction of um, uh, placing a label, basically putting your opinion of, of uh, labeling that incoming message along with other people in the crowd. Um, the, so this is basically how it works. You can then um, order the messages based on that label. Um, so this would be handy for someone like Paul to be able to see, you know, what is the uh, highest, um, uh, highest ranked message, for example, um, for a prayer request or something like that, whatever Paul's goals are. So that's, that's basically how it works at this point in time. Um, you know, there's a lot of areas where this thing could be expanded, um, where the feature set can be expanded, where this could be um, easily scaled for other people. So, you know, if Paul started to use this with success, um, or maybe he uses it and we learn what we should change, right? And we get feedback, um, it could uh, become a useful tool. Um, and then other people may be interested in using it as well. So, um, I do have a lot of ideas for how this thing could change in the future, but what's important is that like some of the important pieces is just having people who are participating, trying to um, generate incoming emails, testing it out um, and, uh, and signing in and interacting with the incoming emails, attempting to find any problems. Um, that's one way to help um, if you're not a software engineer. Um, another way to help uh, would be to increase uh, test automation and uh, contribute toward uh, the proposal of feature requests and the pull request to add feature requests to the, um, you know, to the project. So that's how I imagine people could participate um, at diff with different skill levels and trying to get this thing um, to improve. So. so and, uh I don't understand how GitHub works and how software and stuff works, but um, so you do, but I, I tried playing a, around a little bit with GitHub. Um, and right now, so your code is, is all visible, correct? It is. And, um, yep. So a software engineer should be able to um, use, right now, I think I'm using Docker and Docker Compose. So you could, uh, as long as you have that uh, and I can help you get set up with that, um, you should be able to run it locally. Um, and you know, you should actually be able to connect your own email uh, address to it um, if you wanted to. I mean, this thing could be hosted for other people that you know, right? So it doesn't have to be the one email address. And I, I, I should have documented most of these steps, if not all of them. Okay. And, and so, I mean, if, if somebody is actually um, knows how to program, they would, they would actually be also able to uh, contribute um, code to the repository or not? They so could. Yeah, they, they could. Right now I'm using um, Python and Django framework, uh, Django REST framework. But, um, you know, like I said, this is a proof of concept. So you know, if someone really took interest and wanted to use a different language, it, it, it wouldn't take long to, to get something that's on par with what I've already, already have. And I am willing to help, uh, uh, with, with other languages as well. So I'm not, um, I'm not, I, I learned a, a while ago not to treat this thing like it's my baby. You know, uh, I learned that with some other projects. Um, it's the, What's really important is um, participation. So getting people to try and use it 
um, and provide feedback so that there's this iterative um, improvement over time. Um, that's what's really important. Uh, I'm not going to um, offer your services to uh, in 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 case somebody wants to learn how to work on a project like this and and programming and stuff like that. But um, you know, if if somebody is interested in uh, in actually learning how to program, um, you know, it's you were incredibly kind in in sending me links and. There's a lot of information available, and um, you know it's were any help would be very helpful. Um, partially because um, I I I I don't have the skills to help, <laughs> unfortunately, and um, I don't I also don't have the time to actually learn programming and things like that in order to help you more um, and understand what's what what you're doing. Um, you know, for me, I thought of a lot of things that seemed like they would help. For example, if um, if there was some sort of forum system where people would be able to um, link to a mail message, uh, an email message and, and start discussing it. Or if people wanted to even um, draft some sort of, uh, you know, possible draft response, which would allow somebody like Paul to uh, just sign off on it and say, oh, right, this is, this is a great response, here you go. You know, and, and for a lot of things, for example, if people are, are simply asking for Paul's, so, I mean, in a sense, this is a cust customer response uh, uh, management system, right? And these things do exist, but they require, um, they require paid employees to sit there and actually do the work. And so if, and I think some of them are somewhat automated. I think we've all had to deal with automated response systems. <laughs> um, but the, I, I think what's important here is we're talking about trying to solve a problem for people like Paul, who uh, the reason why they're getting so much email and uh, people trying to get their attention is because they are so popular. And so my, my hope was that we can actually use that popularity to fuel something that is similar to what exists in, in, in the uh, in business, but is actually more um, more usable for communities like ours, and and hopefully, you know, I would like one day for me to be able to um, write something that's uh, interesting enough to Jordan Peterson's community that, well. If I were to write something like that, that it would be something Jordan Peterson would actually be able to reliably go, hey, you know what? When I when I spend time looking at what's at the top of this community, what people have, uh, what my fans have, because you know Joe Rogan. Um, I, I don't know. Do you listen to Rogan's podcast? Um, not regularly. I used to, but um, I listen to the ones that people say you need. You should watch this one. So, so me too. First, first of all, I think this is really important, partially because in our community, I mean, I have a channel and you have a channel, and whenever you flag one of your videos for me, I I will watch it. But just generally, I don't I don't watch all of your videos. 
because right. frankly, if I were to watch all of your videos and Grimm's videos and um, and Grimm knows I love him um, and Paul's videos and I love Paul and Chad's videos, it's more than a full-time job. Right. right. Um, so, I mean, Jordan Peterson says attention is the most valuable thing we have. And I, and I think we both agree with that. Um, okay. And every time somebody goes on Joe Rogan and starts talking about interacting with their fans, Rogan's like, yeah, don't read the comments. Don't, don't read the comments. Don't, don't engage on Twitter. Don't, um, I, I know Rogan has an ins Instagram account. Um, and I believe he's, he doesn't even read the, the comments there. And I understand the reasoning for that, right? There's a lot of toxic people saying stupid things and our attention, our natural psycho psychology isn't properly attuned to the type of feedback that the, that the internet provides. But yeah, I, I think if this project were to actually move forward, it, it could be some, it could be an answer to these problems. One of the things I thought of was not, not allowing people to choose which emails they, they um, mark up, right? Or maybe having a separate system. Like obviously if, if we do have something like the forum, a person would be able to say, okay, this, I want this email. I want to discuss this email. Uh, that seems like one sense-making me mechanism that would work. But another sense-making mechanism would be, uh, you know, if, if you're willing to help with the queue of emails, right, it shows you the, the system decides which emails you see. And then uh, what we could do as a part of that is even have uh, a certain amount of quality control, right? Show an email that we know is spam. And um, if somebody is, is not, you know, somebody gets the wrong answer, right? So maybe, I don't know, 5% of all the emails that they see are uh, actually, you know, test screeners that are showing whether this person is is doing quality, you know, or just figuring out different ways. I mean, it would be nice if, um, for example, if let's say Jonathan Pajot uh, thought so many people thought certain people were very good at. Um, seeing what's good art and what's bad art, right? So as opposed to just asking whoever to rate art that gets submitted to him, uh, only allowing certain people that he feels uh, are knowledgeable about it, right? Or I don't know, Jordan Peterson might want, you know, scientists or psychologists or so, there's there's a lot of places that this can go, and right. I I think what you said about uh, being responsive, uh, you might have not said it on this video, but you've said it several times. Being responsive to the to the user is really important on that. That's why uh, even at this early stage, I did bring it up with Paul, and uh, he looked at it and he. he he said he was actually very excited. He thought it was a great idea. And he mentioned it in one of his videos. I don't know if you, you knew that. Yeah, that was, yeah, I saw, I saw that. The, that's, that is exciting. Um, the idea that someone will actually use the tool is, is exciting. Um, there's, that's the, that's the key with software projects in general is, is buy-in is like, um, will people actually use it? So, um, that's, 
that's kind of the the hurdle is is uh or the questions maybe is like when like um yeah when does a person adopt it at what point at what level of maturity does it have to be and then um to what degree do they use it and push it right um so it's a i know that i guess my feeling is that when someone um starts to use it and starts to push it and it's you know it's you, you start to see the bugs that weren't that weren't seen before you start to run up against um you know problems of scale um so you know there's growing pains and things like that but as that happens i think that's when you can end up um getting more attention on the project itself right so it's as long as it's not being used and it's just there it's a um, there's, it's less likely that people, including myself, are going to try to, you know, uh, add features and make changes to it. Or at least that's how I've, uh, that's my experience in the software world uh, using a kind of agile methodology where we try to have, um, you know, people using the software and uh, having quick iterations of adding improvements and getting feedback from the users. Um, so, that's kind of where I see this being. Um, I, what's interesting is I am learning the, the set of skills that are needed to allow this thing to scale. Um, I also, um, and just as an aside, there's, um, I'm actually in an industry where we, we do this for businesses. So, you know, all the thing that the difference I would say is that this is the, the tool that's created by the company that I work with, they, it isn't geared toward allowing for uh, feedback from the world. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what's different. You know, it's, it's geared toward allowing feedback from users within the organization um, for the most part. But other than that, um, and it's, it's, it's not a big deal, like, but other than that, there's a lot of other things that these tools uh, can do that are being done for businesses in the world today. Um, so yeah, I think that's the, the big difference and, you know, if it gets big enough, you, you do have to end up thinking of, uh, you, you just encounter new problems over and over as it, as it grows. So, um, yeah, that's kind of where I, I, the question, um, yeah, I think, um, the question would be is, is who would adopt it and when, right. And where does it have to be before, um, there would be some attempt to use it, um, and then at that point, I think, um, I think there would, I think it could end up taking off at that point, especially if it's solving the problems that, you know, the person is having, and there's an ability to, you know, um, for, for everyone to see the development of the tool, you know, essentially in real time, you know, from week to week and month to month. So one of the things um, you brought up at the very beginning, which I very much agree with is, um, it's it's a bad idea to have to reinvent the wheel every time. So, um, you know, you mentioned, well, let's see if this tool exists already. Um, and of course there are a lot of CRM systems out there. Um, and like you said, uh, the, the big thing there is, you know, you, you usually you're paying for it per user because you have an employee who's going to be the user and you don't really have a, a great amount of worry about the security of that user. That's an, if this is an employee who's gone through HR, right? Um, and it's somebody who's going to be spending a lot of time, you know, you know you're paying them for their time. And uh, one of the things with this is, A, um, there are going to be users who come make an account, rate maybe rate a single email and then go away, <laughs> right? Right. Um, and, and the question of, of engagement and making it almost gamified right is, is 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 something to to think about but i think just generally a lot of us um 
I know that for people who I think are doing important work that I want to contribute to, right? So I, I work on a few uh, crowd source things, you know, uh, the Cairo Geniza, for example, right? Um, because I, I think it's important, but allowing, allowing anybody who wants to, to come and help, but at the same time, not allowing that to destroy the quality of your work is, uh, it's, it's, it's an important problem. I don't think it's original. I, I don't think it's, you know, something just that the internet has created, although the internet certainly has created that problem. But um, yeah, it's, I, I think this is a very unique situation in some ways, but in some ways it, it's actually not very unique at all, right? There, there's, and being able to take lessons from similar projects um, is, is, is important. What's, um, so I'm gonna, I'll try to, you know, I tried to poke holes uh, at one point and say, well, why don't we use something that already exists? But so what would be like, in my mind, why, uh, why couldn't um, someone like, you know, Jordan Peterson, Eric Weinstein, why couldn't they use, um, or Paul Vanderclay, why couldn't they use uh, Twitter to accomplish um, the goal, the same, to solve the problem we're trying to solve or, or discord? Like, why couldn't they use these technologies that exist uh, to solve this problem? Well, I, I think Paul certainly has tried to use Discord and to some extent he does use Discord. Um, I know that Eric tried very hard to use Discord uh, and was for, for a little while actually using Discord. And it, um, it was actually the success of his Discord which brought people like Bad Stats who uh, from from the very beginning, it was like obvious, well, what are you doing here? You're obviously not a fan of Eric, right? Right. And um, he, and so we've, we've been talking on my server about relational aggression and how little we, especially as males, pay attention to um, relational aggression and relational aggression is real. It's, you know, people will lie, um, but it doesn't even have to be a lie to do re relational ag aggression. You can, in fact, with truths, manipulate people, right? And um, Jordan Peterson, for example, talks about how on Twitter, uh, you know, he reads a, a critical comment and it affects him, right? And there are people who are sending critical comments to uh, people like Eric and, and Jordan Peterson and, and Joe Rogan in an effort to actually um, to actually negatively affect them. So that's, there's deliberate noise being added. In addition to that, there's, there's just the normal noise. I mean, I think, I don't know how much you've been on Twitter, but, um, it, it was a real disappointment for me to see Reddit, which to me seems like a it's it's almost the same thing. Reddit doesn't does does not well. Part of the problem now is that the management of Reddit right is is getting involved. But even without that, you have you you can have a very toxic community, and you end up with the same thing that happened to me with the life insurance thing, right? Uh, the people you know and. 
So that's why I think the securing part is so important. Uh, I would, I mean, if, if it were possible to just replicate Reddit, but add some system where, you know, you could know that people aren't downvoting things just because it's against their interest or um, because they, you know, that you can actually trust the distributed cognition there. I think Reddit is actually a very good type of system like this. The problem is the subreddits, you know, I, I have zero confidence that a PVK subreddit would, um, would result in only the good information being being available to Paul um, and allow people to bring information to Paul in a reliable manner, right? I, I see a lot of videos that sometimes I think, hey, you know, Paul, Paul should, should see this video. Or um, there was one particular sub stack that I, I sent to Eric, uh, I, I, I don't call Eric because I know how many people are calling Eric. I don't text him very often because I know how many people are texting him, right? And that's with a private mobile number that, that he gave me, which I guard very closely, right? It's, it's not even listed on my computers under his name because it was like, I don't want to be responsible if somebody's like, hey, he knows Eric, let me go, <laughs> you know. So right. um, go, go, if, if, if you hack my cell phone, you will not get Eric's, <laughs> you know, cell phone number because that's something I worry about, you know. Um, and, and so similarly with Paul, I, I, don't, I don't send Paul everything that you if, if I see something and I think somebody else will send it, also send it, I'm probably not going to send it to Paul, right? And I think part of the reason somebody like Eric does trust me with his cell phone number or somebody like Paul, you know, will read my messages. If I, I don't know, have you seen his, sometimes his computer screen shows up yeah. on, on Discord and there's like, hundreds of messages right? yeah. and, and, and like there are all these alerts that he hasn't looked at you know and and i i don't blame him he's an individual human being i don't believe the dunbar number which is supposed to be the number that um the number of people that we as human beings can keep track of is actually in the two to 300 range as, as most people do. I think it's probably closer to the 3000 or even up to 5,000 range um, just because we're, we're so different than other animals. But at some point, you know, uh, Eric certainly knows 5,000 people as well as he knows me. He, he knows, 10,000 people as well as he knows me, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. So one thing that I, I, I like the stackexchange.com and they have a, all these uh, kind of children uh, projects. One of them used by software developers is stackoverflow.com. Um, there's sometimes there's jokes whenever like a big company has a problem. And then um, someone will go find a new question on Stack Overflow and say, is, is this you, Facebook? You know, because Facebook's use, they got their developers using Stack Overflow asking the community questions. Um, but one th some things that occur to me um, is that when you join um, like stackoverflow.com, everyone joins kind of equal and they equally don't have a lot of power, right? It's like, there's only a few things you can do. Like you can ask a question and you can provide an answer. 
Um, I think that's true. Um, but you have a limited power. Uh, and then as you participate, you gain more power. One of the cool things uh, that uh, once you gain enough power because you've provided a meaningful question or a meaningful answer that other people have upvoted um, or that has been accepted by someone who asked the question is uh, one of the, one of the, like it occurred to me when you were talking that um, like these people end up with duplicate um, information, right? And so at Stack Overflow, the, the mod, one of the things the moderators do is they try to say, hey, this question has already been asked and then they can close it. Um, and that in itself could reduce the noise, just having a tool like that of being able to say, this question has already been asked, it's over here. Um, it's a, the answer has already been provided and it's over here. Um, and so at that point, you know, the person who's popular does not, um, receive that extra noise, you know, as part of those thousands of, uh, notifications. Um, what, like one of the things that occurs to me is that when you are trying to manage, you know, Twitter and discord and email and your cell phone and, all of these things, it's, um, you, it's hard to detect duplicates, right? Um, so like, you know, the, the people who are doing this as a business, um, I don't even think they are able to detect duplicates, right? So this is one of the pitfalls of having, of, of allowing people to provide input to you from multiple channels. And so there is this thing I read about years ago or a couple of years ago, um, where basically you can create yourself a policy that says, um, if you want to get in touch with me, use this channel, right? And that way, and so that, that's your person basically saying, oh, I'm going to use this one, whether it's our crowdsource mail um, or whether it's a, a Discord server um, or maybe there's a custom Stack Overflow site, you know, something like that. Um, but you basically direct everybody who wants your attention to use a single channel and then the people who are participating, like one of the best things you could possibly do is, is to go in and look for duplicates and, um, and attempt to redirect people to the answers that, for example, to questions that have already been answered, right? Um, this, it's this, um, yeah, it's a really good way to, to, to outsource cognition. So what you do is you end up with your, your writing that is your answer. I do this on my website. I, I create a post um, and I can share a link to the post. And, and then if someone wants to talk about uh, whatever, I could mention anything um, or not anything, but any of these topics, I can just share a link to it. And then as my thinking changes on it, I can actually go in and I use version control and GitHub. I, I actually change my answers and you can actually go back and look at the history of how my thoughts have changed over time, right? So um, this is the kind of process you can use in order to, um, along with a community of people, in order to um, allow people to get in touch with you to provide information that's important to your goals, whatever your goals are. Um, so um, I do think you could, for example, um, like you could, if you had your own Discord server, you actually have more capability to implement your own protocols and processes and procedures, um, more so than if you were to use Twitter, right? Because um, like in my Discord server, I'm playing with a, a channel called a prison system. It's like you could theoretically, everyone, you've seen it in some Discord servers where everybody drops into one channel and then you have to go through and do five steps and you have, um, a filtering process and like some discord servers require that you have a cell phone number. Um, right. So maybe you're a real person or you put in some extra steps to fake a cell phone number. Um, but, and then you could even have it so that they can only respond. They can only produce one message every 24 hours or something. Right. So the benefit of creating your own um, platform like crowdsource mail would be that you could create rules that might be outside the possibility for whatever the other platform is, whether it's Discord or something else. So that's what's nice about being willing and able to create your own platform. Um, but 
that there are there are um, strategies like protocols, processes, procedures that you could you can experiment with in um, in other places as well besides crowdsource mail. So those is kind of my thinking that's arrived as we talk about this. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's my my problem is um, not knowing the the programming. I don't know if something I'm proposing is easy to implement or incredibly difficult. And you know, it's I I think there's there's definitely that whole problem um, when I was talking to Paul about some of the ideas that I had, uh, you know, it's part of it is Paul has to put his attention to something like crowdsource email, right? And that's already a drain on his thing, right? And if it's just the two of us, then if he's spending hours on that, he, it's it's kind of and especially if it doesn't end up going anywhere, <laughs> right? Then he's he's spending several hours just on the two of us out of the thousands of people who are trying to get his his thing, um, I, his attention. I that's why I thought an email address um, and especially so it's set up that you that it will download email from, uh, I believe you can do with any SMTP server or? I think so, the, uh, that's the way it's set up now. It's not the most scalable solution. I don't, I, I don't think it is at the moment. Um, yeah, I'd have to look back at it, but it's, it's a very naive uh, connection. It's not an OAuth or, yeah, it's not using OAuth 2 right now, but it could be um, in the future. So, um, I, I just thought an email address is something that um, is, is just easy enough for people to hand out, right? Um, if, if Paul wanted to use this email, he could put it in his Twitter. Uh, he could put it, you know, it could be on the Discord. It could be on the uh, church's website, you know? Um, right. And... So for people to send emails is pretty easy. Obviously, there's the whole question of spam, right? right. Um, but I, I think I think there's there's a lot of things that can be done um, innovatively if if people are interested in it. Uh, it's it's just finding people who who have the skills and who are interested in co contributing to make something like this happen. And it was a very important thing for me to um, ask Paul to take a look at it because uh, we could create, you know, the, the most wonderful thing. And if Paul doesn't want to use it or if other people don't want to use it, right? then it's it's not <laughs> it's not going anywhere and it's not do, helping anyone. Uh, so Paul looking at it, Paul thinking about the idea and um, endorsing the project. I, I think he he actually wrote on my Discord server, I endorse this project. I forget what exactly. Um, he, he said he's willing to be a guinea pig. So. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the email project, uh, I'm, I'm just looking Paul, what Paul wrote, uh, can't even find the project. Why can't, oh, there it is. Crowd says email. And so Paul, um, came and said, find what he said. uh, there he is. Jacob introduced me to the public email uh, inbox idea. I think it's fantastic. I suspect it would be helpful for me and it could be something that could scale for use to others. I just want to encourage you, Gavin, uh, great idea as it develops. Um, I'm willing to be a guinea pig. Uh, and 
obviously uh, that was great, but then uh, <laughs> Paul Paul's attention went off elsewhere. Uh, and yeah, it's, I, I think this has a lot of potential and I think our community actually has a lot of capacity to, um, to contribute to, to this project. Um, but that's why I'm making the video is, is I, I think people kind of need an invitation and an introduction to it. Um, yeah, so that's my thinking. Yeah, I, uh, I definitely would welcome anyone who is interested in participating or being a guinea pig. So any of yeah. those, that's a, uh, would be welcome. Um, and like, there's, there's many ways to make this thing uh, work and add value for people who are willing to use it. Um, and I have kind of, um, I really do have insider experience on how these tools uh, can work. Um, so that's the part that's hard to sell is that is to, to understand the value that the tool can add um, and being able to help um, basically filter out noise and, and um, identify signals. Um, and basically it's just, it, it, either you have to have a really good presentation um, about it being used in the, in the real world, um, or you have to have some guinea pigs who will try it out and then vouch that, hey, this, this, has, um, this has allowed me to you know, spend whatever, uh, X amount of time instead of you know, 10X, right? right. To, in, order to, in order to prepare, or in order to respond to everyone who was sending me emails, for example. Yeah, I mean, Paul has his email address and which he still gives to people. And I, I just know it's, it's, it's worse than my in email inbox. And in my email inbox, sometimes people's emails get, get, uh, get lost. So, uh, and, you know, <laughs> I, I, I have like 500 clients and still something like that would happen. Um, I, I can't imagine if I had thousands of people who wanted my attention like Paul does. Right. Or, yeah, I mean, and think about the people who have even more, <laughs> more than that vouching for their attention. That's, um, I do think that this technology in general, this like CRM technology um, with kind of this idea of uh, these ideas we've been talking about, I think it, you know, it could be very valuable um, going into the future for for people who are you know popular teachers and popular politicians or whoever. Um, and I don't think they are using these technologies uh, yet, but it's it's going to happen. I do think it's going to happen. It's just um, it's just a matter of who's who's going to make it happen. Who are the people who are going to be the early adopters and and providers of the technology, right? I remember at one point um, you you told me that uh, on that website where programmers ask for advice, you somebody asked for how to do something and there was an answer and then you gave a better answer, but it was later. And so it it couldn't become the top answer because everybody was up uploading that first answer, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, I could find it as well and show you a screenshot, but it's uh, or a link to it. But it, yeah, it's a uh, you can end up with an answer that isn't at the top, but it is uh, the better answer for if your goal, for example, is security. You know, sometimes people have different goals. That's why I keep saying mentioning goals is because you know I I recognize that your goals aren't going to align perfectly with my goals, and so. Um, the tools should be able to solve people's goals, even if they aren't my goals, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and as a crowd, we 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 really want like you could even measure like who are the people who are able to have that empathy for the person they're trying to help in order to help them accomplish their goals. Uh, because I think that's something you know uh, I forget sometimes. I I say I have my goals, and other people should have my goals too. And so. <laughs> Right. And so then I maybe my feedback in the platform wouldn't be as valuable um, as other people who are, are better at recognizing 
um, you know, this popular person's goals and helping them out. So I'm more of the, the IT geek. So, um, and I understand my own limitations. I, I think part of it is also when it comes down to competence, right? Um, I know plenty of people who would like to help uh, and sometimes that they, they just do not have either the skill or the knowledge, um, you know, to actually contribute usefully to something, right? And um, that that becomes a problem. That becomes a huge problem. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, this this is this is a big sandbox that I think people could certainly play with if they wanted to. And um, there are many different things they could do, but it's it's a matter of getting people to to actually be interested in it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, as far as this project goes, I, I've, I've said everything I want to say. Um, w did you want to say, uh, bring up any, oh, there was one other thing. I was actually going to um, read. So this is something that I wrote in answer to somebody on my server, but um, I, I just thought as far as securing cognition goes, it it really shows. And, and so I, I put it, I kind of pinned it because it it I, I, I do feel it is kind of a mission statement for me and the type of community I'm trying to help um, have with other people. So um, what I wrote is, we are all here because we see a lot of not only incompetence, but downright corruption. It is eating away at our society. People are justifiably distrustful. I hope it is perfectly clear that I am just as worried about corrupt and negligent administration of power as everyone else here. But the solution is not to stop trying to find trustworthy people, it is to secure our distributed cognition to earn each other's trust and extend that trust in competent ways. Um, and that was particularly because of a discussion we were having, um, don't wanna say the C word because <laughs> who knows what, what Google will do with it. But um, because of our current situation <laughs> with, uh, uh, with a particular illness. Um, but you know, we we have become very very mistrustful of each other. I think, and um, just you know, Twitter and and Facebook and a lot of these things seem to be designed to make us more distrustful of each other. Um, so yeah, I, I I just think it's really important to to help to foster distributed cognition because an individual human being is not a viable living organism, right? We, we are not these atomized individuals. We would die if we were just by ourselves. Um, and so um, having that distributed cognition and making it secure so that we can trust each other. It's just really, really important. Yeah, this, this, um, the reason that I kind of have done this work is part of a, um, it's a process of growing a network, um, trying to uh, earn people's trust and um, find other people who are trustworthy. And so um, that's ultimately, I think, fundamentally what we're doing. Um, and then this project, um, basically, I'm coming in claiming to be someone who knows how to do you know, software and information technology at scale in order to you know, identify signals and filter out noise, um, providing new tools to, for people. Um, and that's kind of my expertise. Um, and so, yeah, that's so I come in and I try to do this uh, in order to um, 
earn people's trust um, and so that people know that I can do the things that I say I can do. Um, and it ultimately in this, this trust earning uh, exercise and it requires that um, you have to be willing to give some amount of time to other people um, in order to, um, yeah, in order to provide a kind of service, um, but also allow other people to um, help you, right? So it requires being willing to ask other people for help and then also being willing to, to provide a service um, with those skills that, that you can bring to the table. So um, figuring out how to do this on the internet uh, with a community, um, I see it as kind of a, um, I see it as kind of a, a lifelong endeavor. So <laughs> I think, I, you know, I think we'll um, be maintaining our relationship for years to come. And uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll be able to, to help as many people as possible. All right. Yeah. Um, I remember when we first started talking, uh, we discovered that the both of us thought that the internet was um, a really good uh, opportunity where, you know, if, if we put information out there, that it would kind of permanently be out there and the information would finally sift and bubble up to the top. Um, and it, it was certainly disappointing to find out that's that w isn't going to happen, I don't think. Um, and it's increasingly happening less. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure you've noticed it. I've certainly noticed it. Um, there used to be a time when I was, um, when I knew that if I wanted a certain piece of information, I could go to Google, put in certain search terms, and it would come up and I would be able to link that information. I've gone back to using bookmarks. And because I, I, I don't trust that I'll be able to get Google to show me those articles that I actually know are there, right? right. There, there's there's this one article um, that of a quantitative analysis of all of the justices, Supreme Court justices, and they did two different quantitative analyses. And as you would expect, um, the current justices of the Supreme Court are all like there's been I don't know uh, how many I think 160 something like that justices so far, and like. The justices of the current Supreme Court are all towards the top, right? Except for one of them is dead last in this quad. One, she she was a current justice when they did this. Uh, she was the last in both analyses quantitatively, right? Um, showing she's just really, really bad at her job. Um, and so I, I, I like to cite this when people talk about Ruth Bader Ginsburg because it, it's just so obvious she's incompetent at it as a Supreme Court justice when you look at the analysis that they did. Um, but so I-, I Yeah, I had I'd like to, to, you'll have to share that link with me. Yeah, I, I, I had to bookmark it because um, you, you can't get Google to serve it up to you anymore. But yeah, yeah, I mean, so when the Ginsburg movies were out, like people would ask me my opinion of Ginsburg and I would say she's incompetent and illiterate. Uh, <laughs> she, 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 she was completely incompetent in a, and it has nothing to do with liberal, you know, uh, political, she, she, she was incompetent, absolutely incompetent. Um, and so it, I would say that and people would automatically dismiss what I was saying as something political because, well, how could it be, you know, she's a Supreme Court justice, right? Um, right. And honestly, for me, it's, it's a little bit <laughs> weird. And, and, 
I initially found this because I wanted to double check myself. So I actually, instead of trying to find, I just went searching for quantitative analyses, rating justices. I did not expect her to be dead last because um, obviously, you know, each Supreme Court justice has four clerks and being a clerk for a Supreme Court justice is one of the, you know, it's, first of all, it's one of the things pretty much every justice has done. So it's kind of like a job interview. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's a very, you know, competitive, everybody wants to be a clerk, uh, a clerk of the Supreme Court. So she has four of the smartest lawyers in the world as her clerks. And, you know, even with them there, her opinions rank dead last, like below Supreme Court justices nobody's heard of from, you know, like Civil War time. Um, and it's so, I mean, it, it, it goes back to the whole district, you know, distributed You're cognition stuff. Yeah, you were uh, saying that we we uh, we thought we could just put information out on the internet and that would somehow be of be of service and be of benefit to the world. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, and it's it's like no, she she's still incredibly popular, and people like dress up as her for Halloween and stuff, and she's just completely incompetent. <laughs> oh, I'm definitely interested in that in that link. The uh, oh. I, th I feel like there's a. a we're, we have to learn the process by which, um, so it's not that like the, the facts that are important, but it, now it's the, it's more about the process by which, um, people talk about the facts, right. To, to, to talk about the problems, which problems are most important and relevant. And then the, uh, the potential answers to those problems, doing analysis on that, you know, being able to disagree and then how to end the process by which you can actually disagree. So there's, I feel like there's, we haven't, we ha there's more information, but it's kind of like metadata or meta information or something like that, um, that we we're just fumbling around. We haven't really figured out, you know, how to actually have conversations with people who we disagree with. That's what I'm, that's what I want to see more of. I want to see people who disagree with each other having conversations. Well, I mean, okay, but so it, there's two different things going on here. One, people sharing opinions, right? And then things that aren't actually opinion, right? Whether um, a Supreme Court justice is a competent attorney, right? Like that she's, she's talking about the law, right? That's not something that I can demonstrate to you, 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 you would need to go to law school, at, at least spend, you know, several hundred hours reading about cases and stuff, right? Or, uh, you know, you, I'm sure you could tell if somebody is a competent computer programmer uh, very easily, whereas somebody could come and tell me that they, you know, they program in, I don't know, make up a name right oh linux madagascar yeah <laughs> right <laughs> and i would be like okay <laughs> you know right um and and so the prop part of the problem is the two axes there is a question of popularity and stuff like that and opinions and people talking but there there's also just some people like Dun and Kruger, they 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 don't know what they don't know. They don't understand that they don't understand. Um. <laughs> yeah, I I had an old boss, and I would um, I, he had, he would he would I would ask I asked him I said how are you supposed to know how good I am at my job because he was he had never written any software in his life like but he was the guy who was responsible for giving me raises and things like that and I said like I can. I can look at other people in my field and I can tell whether they're, 
as good as me or worse than me and I'm or better than me pretty good because I've been doing it for so long. But how are you supposed to know how good I am at my job? <laughs> and uh, he, he kind of got offended by that. But it was a serious kind of it was a serious question because, um, because it does require a certain level of knowledge just to be able to um, understand someone else's competence, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, there are management techniques, especially if you are a manager, um, because so I, I've, I've studied a lot of this stuff, right? Um, and, and I hear what you're saying. Um, a good manager should actually be able to manage someone without knowing, because you should be able to, um, you should be able to gauge results as opposed to process, right? So mm -hmm. your your supervisor doesn't doesn't need. Um, I I would call it kind of like you know when you make a function call, you don't need to know what's inside the function to know if the function is actually. Um, doing what it's supposed to do, right? Right. So a, a good a good supervisor can can do that. It is possible. It certainly helps to be able to you know to know. Um, but the problem, I mean, sometimes we have to be willing to say. Um, this is an IQ problem, and not everybody has the same IQ. So just going to push back just a little bit. So when, like, I understand that I can look at a black box and I can say, if I put this in, this is what I get out, and I don't have to know what's in the black box. Um, that, that does work to an extent, like, for the immediate analysis, but what's hard is knowing well, what's going to happen in that black box over time. Right. So, for example, if some other software engineer comes in and then looks at what I wrote and they don't understand, they can't read it because it wasn't clean and wasn't easy to read. And maybe, it, you know, it was uh, plenty of reasons. I've written ugly code in the past <laughs> um, and there's people who write prettier code than I do. Um, but, yeah, there's it can be very fragile. Um, and so it could I could end up writing the code where the thing's going to break in the future because it's hard to maintain. It's hard to extend. And so. I imagine it's similar with a lot of other fields as well, uh, where, you know, you could end up with someone who like maybe Ruth Bader Ginsburg ends up helping and the immediate at the immediate time for people who have these immediate goals, but then it, they don't see what's going to happen in five or 10 years because of what she had done. Right. So it's a, if you've been in it for five or 10 years, you, you might know what can happen five years later, but if you, well, if you have well, any, that's so yeah, uh, recently there was a Supreme Court decision that a lot of people, especially in our corner of the internet, were really happy about. And uh, when I heard the decision, I'm like, yay, okay, we got the decision we wanted, right? And then I went and read the actual opinion. And I was like, this is a horrible decision. Um, and this is going to be harmful in our legal system for a really long time. And people were like, but we got, you know, the, we got what we wanted. And it's like, yeah, but you're, I mean, when, a, when the Supreme Court decides something, right, that becomes precedent all over the country. And all of all of the courts below the Supreme Court are supposed to use that, the opinion, that decision as precedent, right? So in a sense, I guess it's like they're using that code, right? right. And if it's bad code and everybody's going to now have to use that code, it, it's, it's incredibly destructive to the system. So right. yeah, I, I I certainly hear what you, what you mean by that. Yeah, I mean there's there's there are competence things that go into stuff, um, and it's it's hard to quantify. Um, for example, if if I'm saying something about what 
the Hebrew says in the Bible or about insurance or, you know, most people, they just have no, they, they, they simply do not have, I mean, it's not, even if they have the competence to actually learn everything necessary for it, they haven't done it. I've been, I've been an insurance uh, agent for 10 years, right? And that experience is not something that I can impart to you simply, right? right. Um, so yeah, I mean, same thing, same thing with you. Yeah. One, one, what I like, so I'd mentioned I'm not, I don't write the cleanest code. Um, so I, I've encountered a couple of geniuses that write very, very clean code. Um, and they, they're very good at doing architecture and doing design. And, and I managed to get them into my same team for a while. And so I would hear one of them, you know, make a kind of a comment about how they would do it. And so that's whenever I can go and listen to someone who's better than me at something, I can find out what, how they would do it. And then I go to the other person who often would correct me on my mistakes. And I say, so what do you think about this? So I can take two people who are very competent, um, and ideally, it's nice when you find two competent people who disagree and then be able to listen to them, because I do think I have an ability to like follow along and learn and ask questions and understand what people are saying and, and try to fill in the gaps and see where things are connecting and when they're not connecting and ask the questions to, to reveal the things I don't know um, and be able to take people who disagree and at least come to an understanding of like why they disagree. You know, there's trade offs or something. So that's kind of what we're missing. Like, for example, there's the, you know, with the C word, there's the, there's the, the, there's the conversation that needs to happen between, you know, these two or three people and these two or three people, and it needs to be happening regularly for hours. Um, and so that the conversation can continue, uh, <laughs> because otherwise there, it's just, a, it's just an echo chamber and a monologue, right? There's, and there's no, um, you know, patiently expressing these, these detailed thoughts and then having the other person um, respond without any time constraints, right? Whereas it just can go slowly and someone like myself would be able to just ask the question and just identify it and say, this person is valuing this and is more risk averse or whatever in this regard. And this person has a different perspective and and that's just how it is, right? <laughs> so, right. So, so you're bringing up really important stuff that, um, you know, I. So, you. This is really important stuff you're bringing up. Um, most of us do a sort of triangulation for things we don't know very much, very well. Where we say, "Let me go find two experts who disagree, hear them out." Right. And then I'll, with my skills, I'll be able to decide which one of these two experts I agree with more. Right. Um, and, you know, that type of triangulation works very well if you have two competent experts regarding whatever you're doing. And that's why a lot of our, um, media was set up in such a way that, you know, as a reporter, you would go find two people who disagreed on an, on an important issue. You would find two experts and you would cite some of some, uh, the, the people and try to, you know, explain what these people are disagreeing. And then people would be able to read that, uh, that account of it and based on that make decisions, which is a great way of doing it. Um, the problem is pe that people notice that's what everybody does. So they said, oh, well, what we can do is we can change the experts that people listen to, right? And change the triangulation. Most people like to be somewhere in the center. They hear two experts disagreeing and they're like, well, you know, the, each one must 
must know something. So let's let's try to find, steer a, a middle course, which is great. But if somebody's moving those posts and you're triangulating based on that, so yeah. uh, the the one. I, Are I you like talking about the Overton window, basically? Kind of. That's that's part of it. Um, so the. <laughs> I, I don't know if you saw, this is one of the earliest Jordan Peterson uh, appearances. He was on TV Ontario um, and there was a, so they had him on and they had a professor on who was kind of supposed to present the other side, right? And the other professor said, um, I don't have time to explain it, but um, medical pro uh, professionals know that there's no such thing as gender right or or sex or something like that it, it was it was something so idiotic that i actually had that i stopped the video looked up the person to see how somebody could say something that dumb right <laughs> um but it that was the expert and i think for a lot of people they were like well he, he's saying it with such, you know, and, and Jordan Peterson didn't even respond to, to that because it, it was just so obviously dumb, right? Uh, that, I mean, it's just beyond. Um, and yeah, we, we, so this triangulation only works if you, if you can actually find experts who are not lying right so if somebody is willing to absolutely just lie and emphatically you know say something because they know that you're going to be triangulating and they want they want you to uh triangulate somewhere in the middle um another example of this i give is so uh there was this supposed debate about the um about the Roman Catholic Church, right? And this is, atheists watch this video. It has millions of views, right? And they got two of the worst people on earth to uh, represent the Roman Catholic Church. It was a, an archbishop from Nigeria who didn't speak English very well. And this nun who is known for being incredibly shrill and unlikable. <laughs> and, you know, she, she's, she's very well known. She's very famous as one of these like horrible people, right? So they were representing the Roman Catholic Church and the debate was with Stephen Fry and Christopher Hitchens, right? right. So you get two of the smartest, most likable, funny um, atheists in the world, and you have them debate a Roman Catholic nun. She's a nun. She should be able to represent the Roman Catholic Church, who whose voice is shrill, and she she's just a really unlikable person, right? She she right. that's what she's famous for, and you get this guy who. You know he's he's an archbishop. He I think he was a cardinal, right? A high-ranking church official from. But English was obviously not his first language, so just listening to him, half the people were, yeah. And it's like, well, why didn't you get a bigger pu punching bag? <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, that was. It's a, I guess the phrase comes to mind is sandbagging. And then I was also the, uh, I was thinking of this, um, I guess Donald Trump would use hyperbole. So you can, uh, if you're going to go into a negotiation, you can always go kind of extreme so that you, you, uh, you get what you want, right? So you, you ask for more than what you want, for example, or you, you offer less than what you want just to get it to where you want it. So it's just a kind of a manipulation technique. Yeah, and that's that's what people are doing. And unfortunately, um, when your experts experts are people who are speaking in such hyperbole, 
um, and negotiating and, and trying to manipulate you, that's, that's insecure cognition. That's, that's going to ruin. Uh, and a lot of people are going to fall for it. Yeah, I think there's, a, there's this status seeking that's going on. Um, and so there are people who end up with a, more status than they deserve. And so then they tend to be the ones who don't want to have that um, kind of long form conversation in a, um, you know, with someone who's actually an expert. Um, this is, this is one of the things I talk, I got to talk about Donald Trump uh, recently. And one of the things that I wish a couple of things I wish he had done differently, but one of them was I wish he had kind of put his foot down on how the elections were run. Um, and he could, he could have required, you know, a long form conversation, um, which included, you know, Joe Jorgensen and, um, and, uh, president Biden. Right. But, you know, they get to set it up in such a way such that, you know, someone who's not an expert, right. Can end up faking it and keeping their status. Uh, that's, that's what, that's all I see. Right. And it's, so it's a, it's kind of why I've, I would like to try to be able to, I don't know, I'm interested in trying to uh, facilitate those kinds of conversations between experts who have disagreements, because I think there's definitely, um, there's some topics and issues where people should be able to disagree and, and they maintain their expert status and it's reasonable, right? So. Um, I think that's part of the reason why Joe Rogan is actually so popular, you know? Uh, listening to someone speak for two or three hours as opposed to the sound bites that you get but you know it's most people most of my friends are not don't have the time um and even if they do have the time unfortunately i mean so my my dad asks me so where do you get your news and I tell them I don't, then the news is completely, you know, um, it's, it's, it's not, we are not getting news. We are there. What presents as news. So like what I kept on telling them is just don't watch the news because they watch the news on TV. Right. right. And they think, okay, so it's got to be NBC, ABC, CBS. One of these has to has to be, you know, nightly news that I can watch. And I tell them, no, you can't watch any of them. And watching them makes you dumber. Right. <laughs> right? right. Like, I, I, I have done this several times with um, John Oliver, you know, a nightly news tonight or whatever he has. Right. right? Um, several... I, I, I used to do this. I would, he had like a 15 minute segment on health insurance and I went through and I wrote uh, on Facebook this really long thing where I showed how somebody who watched his informative explanation knew less after they watched it than before they watched it. And I'm serious about that, right? He, what, what you learned from what he said is things that were just untrue. So you were dumber <laughs> afterwards. Right. And um, I, I just remember I, I, I sent somebody to, um, to that and they said to me, this is too long. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like what, what what do you expect me to do? And for a lot of people like look, you have you have kids, you have a job, you have a wife and I I understand why a person who has kids can't listen to podcasts as much as I do, right? right. Um and frankly, I probably listen to too many anyway, right? Uh, um, and your your life shouldn't have to be involved in all of this stuff in order to 
be able to quickly get information. That's, that's the point of cognitive outsourcing, right? So that you can go on with the rest of your life and you don't feel like you have to be a, a medical doctor in order to understand what's going on with the C word, right? Um, but I've gotten to a point where uh, the only person I, I trust, there's a few people I trust regarding the C word, uh, including Sam Adams, right? Because right. I know that he's actually a biostatistician with primary data. And I know that he's not depending on anything that's going on, right? Um, or, uh, you know, I have family members who are doctors who are in actually prominent positions um, and they have real information. I know that they have real information and they're not corrupt, right? right. Um, but, you know, with, Without Sam and without those family members who are doctors, I, I don't think it's possible for a person to get really good information. Um, I know Joe Rogan tries, uh, you know, when he had Sanjay Gupta on, uh, he just embarrassed him. And, you know, when he has the other guys on uh, who are against, um, yeah, I hear what they're saying, but, um, it's not like I have confidence in them either. Um, and I actually, so I tried getting this family member of mine, um, to, to go on Rogan. Um, and he's in a position that I think Rogan would actually have him on to talk about it. He wouldn't touch it. Yeah. He wouldn't touch it. And, and I, 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 I perfectly understand why, you know, he's, he's in a very, you know, he's worked very, very hard to get to the position he's in. Um, and, you know, many, many years and what, and he doesn't see how it would benefit him to go and step into this, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, it would uh, it probably would not be it. Like, I guess the question you ask is, how would it be helpful to anyone? So, so for me, it's like what I, what I told him is, it's not like I want him to go say, like, if if he went on and said exactly the same thing that that you know, the the mainstream narrative is um i still think that would be a lot better than what's going on because you know we we've, we've discussed things like that medicine the i word and right. um he he really he he's like no we we tried that i i have the data i i i, I don't think it's it's any good and if i did think it was any good i i would use it and the fact is if he wanted to use it he's in a position where he gets to decide he could use it right um but it and and i i talked to him and he's like he's like no i i don't think that's that's an effective medication and i trust him or when it comes to the V word, right? Um, so he had his kids take it. And I know that all the money in the world, there is nothing, nothing that could get you to get him to allow even something he has any doubts would harm his kids no way it's it's like the same as i i don't believe you would ever do anything to harm your kids i don't think he would um he would use you know any sort of medication with his kids that he had any doubts about he's he 
there's nothing in this world that's more important to him than his kids. And, you know, he, he got the shot, uh, the ouchie, right? Yeah. For, for young kids. Yeah. Well, there's, I think there's probably, there's always trade-offs and then you have, you have different um, situations like that. Some people are in more risky situations than other people. Everyone's in a unique situation. So you can have different reasons for the decision you make. Yeah. So it's like, for me, as, as soon as I listen to someone basically ignore the fact that what, no matter what side you're on, but ignore the fact that there are other people in situations where the decisions they made were, were they had thought about them and they arrived at their decision, they calculated the risks. Uh, and made a decision, you know, whether they did it the way you want it, you would do it or not. It's like, a, yeah, that's, that's whenever, whenever you hear, you know, the president, basically pre leaders of countries getting mad at people who aren't doing what they think they, who aren't accepting the same risk analysis. All right. It's like, it's just not very smart to, it, it's it, not, it's not smart for them to forget that there's people who live in a rural part of the country, you know, that are in a situation you know, where they, they're by themselves in a rural part of the country um, versus someone else who lives in a densely populated city and has a, a compromised immune system. It's like, those are two completely different stories. And to treat them as if they should both be making the same decision, it's similar to what you're talking about with life insurance. It's like, not everyone needs, needs the life insurance. Just like, you know, not everyone. And some people you would say definitely should have it. And you would say some people shouldn't, but it's similar with, with all yeah. these kinds of uh, solutions to a problem. It's like, it's not a one size fits all thing. The, this is why I want this. I would love for this person to go on Joe Rogan because he is actually the type of person who talks like this all the time. He's, yeah. You know, there's a reason why he got to his position. He is, uh, and he's a surgeon, right? He's always calm like this man is a machine he's always calm always circumspect always nuanced aware of the situation and that's that's how he got to be his where he is right yeah. um and people like that aren't being listened to this is where the literal truth versus like the metaphorical truth uh kind of can can take a nasty turn right where like uh you know do a does a porcupine throw its quills so it's like uh you know do you have to wear the m word you know whatever it's like um sometimes the, the people will feel like saying something is true will end up being good for the most amount of people what and so then it would be you know metaphorically true or pragmatically true but it wouldn't be literally true you know with the with all of the nuance because once you start, I mean, the, I can see that perspective. I've heard that kind of argument and that perspective that, that, you know, you can be like that basically it is people believe it is unresponsible to tell, to attempt to tell the complete truth with all of the nuance, because that you could just end up confusing the masses <laughs> into that ends up having a, a net negative for the, for the population. Right. And well, I'm not, I'm not a fan of that. I'm not a fan of that, but that, uh, that is some people's perspective. And, and honestly, I, I can see, so when we first started um, and they were saying that nobody should buy uh, the coverings, right? And it was obvious to me that properly used coverings would obviously help. I mean, if you properly use them, if you properly use them, right? And, um, and I heard them, people saying, no, 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 you should not use it. Um, and it's not gonna help. And frankly, I kind of sort of knew that it was true because I knew the vast majority of people were never gonna use them correctly. And the doctors who were going to use them correctly couldn't get them, right? Um, and while I would, I would have, so Eric, said, and I agree with, if you level with people, they will actually understand. You tell them, you know what? Learning how to use protective gear for uh, viruses 
that's not a simple thing. That's that's a procedure that you know you should probably you you should take a lab class in, right? And actually know how to use it, right? Um, I, I see people wearing them while they are exercising. That is insane because not only are you being it's... right, but when a protective gear gets gets wet, as opposed to being a barrier, it becomes a magnet, right? When, if, if you're breathing through a wet protective gear, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, um, then what happens is it, it, the, it, it, it just becomes a huge magnet for viruses and bacteria and stuff like that. You should never, ever get it wet. Right? It, if it's wet, you should not be using it, right? But, but of course, people are sweating into them while they're exercising outside, right? And it's, it's so. It, it's uh, become a, a, another status symbol, like a, a MAGA hat, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So people wear them like some, you know, Republicans will wear a MAGA hat. And now yeah. you have uh, Democrats wearing these things just uh, as a status symbol, basically saying, look at me. This is what I represent. But maybe, you know. Okay, we have three minutes. Um, was there anything you wanted to desperately make sure uh, people hear? No, I enjoyed the conversation. And yeah, it's, if... Um, yeah, if you if you're interested in you know building technology, um, and yeah, if you have technology that you've been built your own projects or anything, you can get in touch with me. I at least can put some eyeballs on it and and just be aware of what's going on. But I also would invite you to help us uh, with this project, and hopefully, I would love to see you know people like uh, Paul Vanderclay or. Um, Eric Weinstein, I'd love to be able to help these people because I do think there, there are ways to, to provide help with information technology to solve some of these very real problems. Um, so, yeah, well, that's Paul it. Has, Paul has definitely bought in. And so um, what I can say is if, if you're interested in helping Paul, um, this is one of the ways that you can, in fact, do it. Um, I And uh, you don't have to be a computer programmer. Uh, just being someone who's interested in even just sending some emails to this email for testing, logging into the website, um, you know, just looking over things, uh, talking about it, and we we can actually have distributed cognition in our community. Um, and yeah, I, I think this, this could be r really great. Yep. I agree. <laughs> I am going to stop the recording. <laughs>